evening, everybody. So the Danish author Isaac Dinsen talks about to be a person is to have a story to tell. And one of the things I love about that quote is that it's not as if we live our lives over here and then tell the story afterwards at the kitchen table with our families or at a campfire with our friends, but rather we as human beings are constantly living life through our narratives. And it's that indelible connection with the development of ourself and the development of our narratives that ultimately makes us human. And that's the connection as a storyteller and as a performer I've really worked to mine and see how that lever, that, that, that fundamental connection between self and story can be used for social change, and some of which I'd like to share with you tonight. Now, at a basic level, I suppose we should start with what is story. And story, simply put, is a literal interpretation of events with a character that has to deal with some sort of problem, and over the course of that story, will do a set of actions to be able to resolve that essential conflict or make a decision not to resolve it. But a story is not a literal interpretation of those events, meaning it's not a list of the actions that are taken to solve that conflict. Um, what it is, though, is a way that we as the audience can live through the story of that character and find meaning behind those actions. So for example, with Star Wars, it's not like we find like a list of, well, Luke Skywalker went to Tatooine. Well, Luke Skywalker then went to go study with Yoda. Oh, there's Luke Skywalker killing the Emperor. Um, but at, rather, what we find is what are the crucial turning points in that film that allow him to go from the journey of being a boy to a hero. And whether it's a big, massive movie like that, or our own personal stories of how we you know, deal with our day-to-day glories and our griefs, the understanding of meaning is what's really critical to understanding the social function of story. So one of the things I think that we talk about, and, and this was definitely a model that came out of the work and what we've been using in our work in Appalachia, is simply put, when we talk about story and its social function, through story, we know ourselves, we come to know each other, and we build a shared vision of the world. And this isn't something that was a theoretical model that we developed out of an academic setting or something that came out of intensive policy studies with both metrics, quantitatives, as well as qualitative data points. This came from a very personal lived experience for me around story, and very specifically about one of heartbreak. Um, so to give you some context, my, I, I'm Indian, but I'm also untouchable. And I just wanted to get a, a range of hands, like how many people have heard about the untouchable people in India? That, that's great. It's often rare, but it's great. Um, so for me, I think growing up in the United States, it was very isolating because when you think about the caste system, it's one of the oldest systems of oppression in the world. And in that system, my community is considered untouchable because we're considered spiritually polluting to people because of the things and the jobs that we would do. And in some places, we'd have to carry a pot around our neck because if we spat, that would be considered polluting. Um, and some untouchables have to carry a broom because like where they walk, their footprints are considered defiling. And there's even a set of untouchables who are unseeable because the very sight of them defiles others. And I think in the face of such a soul-crushing system, it's very difficult to kind of find your way to name your own experience and claim your own um, place with the rest of humanity. And even more so in the United States because people just don't know. And even though, you know, most people when you, you talk about being untouchable, they think, oh, maybe it's 100,000 people, maybe it's 200,000 people, but we're actually 300 million people. That's just a little under the population of the United States and yet nobody knows what we've gone through and what we continue to survive through. And, and even more particularly, I think, um, the, the numbers and the statistics around the quality of the oppression that we face is just staggering. So much so that every hour, three untouchables are murdered, two are raped, and two houses are burnt. And for me, I think, growing up, when I heard that statistic, I just, I couldn't see past the numbers. And I think that happens a lot when we're working with communities that are marginalized and that are struggling. In, the, in the, the huge swath of those numbers, we don't get a sense of who's a mother, who's a father, who's a sister, who's a brother, and how do they get placed emotionally so that we can make that connection across oppression. 
So for me, story was that one way that you could then emotively ground those statistics. It was one way to be able to reach across oppression and build a bridge of understanding, of meaning, and of power. And so I was going to share with you one of the songs that I, that I made from that example. Because in, in my community, the high-tech model of working was actually song. Because the tradition in the untouchable communities, we were, specifically my caste, we were, we were ostracized for singing. And we have a, a notion of story song. So this was a song that I made of just like oral testimonies that came out of like one of the survivors of atrocity. So we'll, we'll, I'll sing it, and then we can share it a little bit. They came around midnight right up to the door. My husband tried to stop them, but they shot him to the floor, so I grabbed up my children, and I raised them to my chest. I said, please don't take my heart, but they took my heart. And left me with nothing. I'm building a bone well. I'm raising my dead. I'm building a bone well. And I'm raising my dead. What you why um, I, I created that song was emotionally you could read a text about this mother who was a survivor in a village where people had basically, um, they were organizing in this village for a living wage. And, um, and a living wage for them was instead of like a half a kilo of rice a day, it was like a full kilo of rice. And, um, and the repercussions was all the men in the village were massacred from the grandfather to the little babies. And, um, but the way it got represented in a newspaper was just a two-line headline, you know? It wasn't a story, it was a listing of facts. There was no meaning, there was no personal connection, there was no story. And so creating that song in the tech that was particular and appropriate for my community as a song really made the difference of being able to get across some of the linguistic barriers that related to some of those women and the communities that I also exchanged with but also could right then take you to that heart connection right away and, and give back a little bit of that humanity. And so whether it's a song, a digital story, or a film, as, as participatory filmmakers, and for people that are thinking about engaging with media, I mean, a way to illuminate and build bridges, uh, I think that that's one of the things you always want to keep in mind. What's important isn't the technology. What is important is the heart, your heart, as there as a witness, your heart as there is a media maker, and the heart of your subject and your collaborator. And if those lines are open, anything is possible. But that has to be the center, not the camera, not the computer, not your notes, not the metrics. It's the heart. And I think that, for me, I, I really think that that's a very profound thing to draw from, because 
the challenge I had as an untouchable is not unique to people that are untouchable. I think all across the world, we're struggling with the fact that we really are at a crisis of narrative about the future that we want to create for our communities and our planet. So much so that on Friday, we have sequester cuts going into place in our country because we can't make agreements about what kinds of decisions we want to make for the future of our nation. So in many ways, when we're able to talk about story and get rooted from the subjective perspective, we can build common ground where maybe there hasn't been stuff for a very long time. I think because of the challenges that we have uh, before us, one of the things we have to do as artists and as community members engaged with story and thinking about story for social change is we really need to challenge ourselves to think out of the box and look at and challenge what are some of the frames of story that we're thinking through? What are the mediums we're using to tell our stories? And what are the values that that represents? And are there new and traditional genre, new, new genres we can experiment to get the story out? So for example, if you're working on a community-based agenda around um, health, which is one of the, the issues that we're working on here with the New River Valley, um, most people, when they talk about health, talk about it in terms of disease, or talk about it in terms of dysfunction, like substance abuse, heart attack, hypertension. We very rarely think about health as part of a spectrum of wellness and think about the institutions past the hospital, past the clinic, that can support wellness, whether it's the gym or a fitness center or um, uh, you know, um, community centers that allow for like kind of spiritual and mental health. To be able to then think out of the side of the box of health, to look at that spectrum, really is part of one of the things we were doing in terms of using this model to think outside of the frame, use different mediums, question the values that are used, and push in terms of genres. I think the other thing that is really important that I, I like to kind of frame and think about the urgency of story as a unit of change is that really the future of where we are is the future of the stories that we want to tell. And, and I think that if we can spend time together one-on-one, -on -one, collectively, and really push the possibility of where we want to go in our narratives, the imaginary becomes this very critical battleground for possibility. Now, so talk specifically. Now, my work, then some of the examples I'll be given, will range from my work around digital storytelling all the way to the way that I've done participatory filmmaking and used some digital storytelling techniques with larger formatted projects. So, but I think to just start with digital storytelling, I wanted to make sure we were all using the same kind of language around um, the medium. So a digital story is a short three to five minute film, and it's made with the found ephemera of regular people's lives. So it's mostly a post workshop. It takes place over three days. And the core focus of that workshop is about people finding and identifying their narrative and then building relationships in a story circle around that narrative. And then they go on to build that story with found ephemera that includes still images, letters, montages, things that they've built through their lives with the emphasis on the voiceover that kind of undergirds the whole process. Uh, the other thing to kind of know um, with digital stories is that while a lot of people use the term digital storytelling to look at narrative across lots of different kinds of transmedia applications, for the purposes of what we're talking about, we're talking about these very short three to five minute clips. Now, one of the things that I found very useful, and I, I was very lucky, uh, I started off at the Center for Digital Storytelling when I was 21 or 22 and, um, and had, was given a lot of responsibility and was given the opportunity to build the first national community digital storytelling program. So with my uh, grassroots community organizing experience, I was able to take this very beautiful, very simple production model and then apply it to the ways that we build leadership, we create openings in a grassroots organizing context. And I found that in doing that, one of the things that was really incredible about digital stories is that they allow for community members to claim personal voice in very technical and very oftentimes um, isolating contexts. So for example, one of the projects that we worked on um, in the Valley, which Carol Davis is here with the Livability Initiative, um, is, was, was something in where we worked with different people from lots of different policy areas, from housing to the environment um, to, uh, to, to arts and culture. 
And instead of starting from a top-down hierarchical conversation that was highly technical using policy terms, we were able to use the digital storytelling workshop in that process to give community voice, to give personal language, to give emotive language to all of those issues and build relationships through that. And being able to do that allows community folks to be at a table at a table that they might feel a little bit more intimidated about and not as engaged in from the beginning. I think the other thing is, is that what's remarkable about the workshop, and this is true with most community-based art projects, is that you can find usefulness in both the process of the making of art as well as in the product of making of the art. And the process of the workshop is in incredibly important in terms of the ways that it builds trust, creates a space that's very safe for people to kind of connect to their subjective experience and then relay and connect to someone else. But after the workshop, the product also has another life because it becomes an artifact of that truth sharing. It becomes that artifact of that space that was created and that opening that happened. And you never know how, but oftentimes communities will often create a distribution model that's specific and relevant to them whether it's showing it at the local cafe on a laptop that stays up there, or on a cell phone that you can share quickly with your friends, or in a formal theatrical space, distribution and the sharing of that artifact also becomes a really important place where you see movement and opportunity and transformation. Um, and then I think the other thing is, is that just in general, um, digital stories and the process of the workshop creates a space for new ways of thinking. And I think this is really important, particularly when you have conflict in a community. Because oftentimes, if you take two people who are ideologically, diametrically opposed, and you sit them in front of each other around an issue that they're opposed, um, they will not get anywhere. Person A was going to stick to their position, and person B is going to stick to their position, and there's no coming together. But if you put those same people within a story circle, all of a sudden you start to find new openings because they're not talking about ideological positions, they're talking about the memory of their mother that influenced them around that decision. Or they're talking about what it was to grow up in that neighborhood and seeing that memory of that specific moment really change and shifted and why that made their position so clear and specific for them. So when you start to see someone not as an ideological position, but more as someone who's a mother, or a father, and a, with social relationships within their community, with a connection to deep geography, those details allow you to find a humanity in that opposing position that becomes um, really quite remarkable. So I wanted to show one of the pieces um, that we did in uh, combination with a group called We Build the Dream that wanted you to do a series of short pieces about Martin Luther King and reclaiming some of MLK's legacies around economic justice. So we'll show it and then we'll talk about it. Everyone knows Martin Luther King. Or do we? Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday is our one national holiday that's about social and economic justice. But what would King do if he were alive today? What would King do if he were you? I have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. People forget that Dr. King was a controversial figure in his time. Growing up under segregation in Atlanta, King frequently questioned authority. At 25, he was a pastor in Montgomery where he began his fight for justice. When Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a Montgomery bus, King and others organized a boycott that eventually ended racial segregation on Montgomery's bus system. King was arrested, his house was bombed, but he was fearless. After founding the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, he became involved in many local campaigns which led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. It took 10 hard, long years for organizers to get from the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. A lot of their campaigns didn't succeed. They were constantly criticized, just like movements today. No man has a civil liberty to come up here and disrupt government. No man has a civil liberty to block traffic. But King's dream would not be denied. Now we are in a new phase, and that is a phase where we are seeking genuine equality. In 1968, just before Dr. King was assassinated, he started the Poor People's Campaign. 
It was the Occupy movement of 1968. Thousands of poor people of all races set up an encampment called Resurrection City to demand jobs, housing, and equality. I hope the nation understands that even with the problems here, that people ate three meals a day for the first time and had health care for the first time in their lives. King's movement didn't die. It was never just about one person to begin with. The movement for social and economic justice is still evolving. We are millions of people, thousands of organizers. We come from every background. We work on every issue. We live in every community. In the decades since the 60s, the gap between rich and poor has only gotten worse. At a time when Wall Street rakes in record profits, the American dream is slipping out of reach for more families. But things, things are changing. Inspired by Arab Spring, students and unions in Wisconsin took over the state capitol to protest cuts and attacks on labor. Occupy Wall Street inspired hundreds of occupations across the country with over 5,000 arrests for economic justice. There are so many ways to get involved and continue Dr. King's legacy. We have to ask ourselves, what would Martin Luther King do if he were alive today? What would King do if he were you? So I think one of the things that was interesting about that piece was that it was done in a collaboration with over 200 community grassroots organizations who were all going to use this piece to talk about what the act of service meant on Martin Luther King Day. And I think that for me working on it, even though I had known about Martin Luther King, I wasn't aware of his legacy of economic justice and I had no idea about the impact of Resurrection City and that there was at that time this idea that people occupied DC to be able to share and talk about um, what they wanted in terms of values for poor people and to be able to create an equitable economic conversation in this country, which is still pretty relevant today. <laughs> um, but uh, beyond that, my early digital storytelling work started with an organization called Third World Majority. And we were a woman of color media justice organization. And we were one of the first women of color technology collectives in the country. And what was very interesting about the work that we did was that we were a computer technology center that when we, that when we started that didn't have either computers or a technology center. <laughs> but what we had was a methodology and a sense of integrity of wanting to put communities at the center of our work and having the people who trained be the, the people from the communities themselves. And I think that that's really a lesson for anyone in this room that is really interested in engaging in participatory media. If you have a strong enough idea, if your integrity and your heart is in the right place, the resources will come. But if the methodology is not in place, nothing's going to hold. Because you can't throw money at a problem or at a film, uh, at, at a participatory <coughs> process. Money doesn't solve that. What really solves it is really being grounded, doing the work, and really putting communities at the center. And I think one of the things that this, we had a seminar earlier today, which we talked about, um, we were very inspired by the Highlander Center and the sense of, in the freedom schools at the Highlander Center, people were learning in the, the literacy schools that they had, the first piece of paper that would help them be able to make a better, uh, a better day in their lives, which was the voter ballot. And I think similarly with media production and with participatory media, we live in a media ecosystem where we are primarily only consumers. That shifted somewhat within um, social networking where we're broadcasting in a limited way, but fundamentally we live in a consolidated media landscape. So our sense was, similar to Highlander, we would view our participatory media training space as a place where people could start to shift their ideas about being consumers and then becoming creators so that they become agents of change within their communities around structures of media, the memes of media that was being told about them, and also the ways and relationships people would build around that. Um, and a lot of the work that I've done in the Valley is inspired from, uh, from that experience. And the, the beginning part of our narrative praxis collaboration that I have with my colleague, um, Holly, um, was a project called Healthy NRV, 
uh, that was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The idea being that we wanted to work with young people in the various counties around um, the New River Valley to be able to see what the young people in those communities thought about health. And because, once again, people did not own the narrative and their own story around health, some of the first kind of takes people had were about disease and were about drug abuse, and wellness wasn't even on the picture. And through the course of the two years that we've been working with the young people, we used the workshop not only to take a temperature as to where they first started, but then to also um, develop shared and build narratives around new language so that we could talk about a spectrum of wellness. So we could look at, OK, when I go to Giles, one of the kids was like, we don't have a grocery store. And now they use the term, and we live in a food desert because there's no healthy food options. So then if you're talking about nutrition or if you're talking about obesity, you can see where the clear gaps are. Well, most young people don't have those language skills to talk about that because we're never given a chance to own that story around um, our health. And owning the story around health is like a first step to being able to own wellness as a whole. Um, so I wanted to show one of the pieces that came from that. This is our collaborative. Um, I'll go ahead and hit play. When someone makes the decision to do drugs, they don't realize that they are not just harming themselves, they're also harming the people around them. When I was 13, my friend Courtney lived next door. We would go to the swimming hole and just hang out at each other's house. Courtney had a sister named Ashley who was always in trouble. She was only 19 and had a son who we used to babysit. One night, Ashley did pills and showed up at her mom's house. She stumbled her way into the house and was totally out of it. She couldn't even remember how she got there. She could barely talk and eventually she passed out. But the worst part was she had her one-year-old son with her. The ambulance was called for her and her mom was crying and trying to get her to wake up. Her sister took her son in the other room. When she got to the hospital, they pumped her stomach and sent her home a couple days later. Courtney's sister refused to get help, and she ended up losing custody of her son about a year later for child neglect. A few months after she lost custody of him, she went to jail for possession. Courtney's mom was afraid after that to let her do things, and my mom didn't want me over at her house if Ashley was there. When one person makes the choice to do drugs, they knock down others in a terrible domino effect. They don't realize that they are harming the people who care about them the most. Ashley hurt her mom and her sister, even her son. Before you make the decision to do drugs, think about the people around you. Because when you make that decision, it's not just about you. So one of the things that I always find remarkable about that piece was remembering the journey Tiffany took to make that piece. So when she first came into the workshop, she was easily the quietest person, never made eye contact for the most part, and would always end all of her sentences with a, I guess so, you know, <laughs> the thing where you start to dismiss what you're saying by ending up on the high note. Um, and she just didn't feel like she had a point of view or something to offer, not just in general about the issue of health, but just in general. And I think the process of working on her story, getting the affirmation not only from the facilitators, but really from her fellow like participants in the story circle, gave her a, a sense of confidence to not only inhabit fully her voice and inhabit that room, but when she came away with that piece, it was such a sense of accomplishment. And you know, when you think of social change, there's lots of different models of social change. There's the internal, there's the interpersonal, and there's the structural and the institutional. And I think what's very important about when you're adapting or thinking about a, a using a participatory model of media with a community is to think in those categories what your impacts might be. Um, and I think in that moment, there was no question in our mind that we had achieved what we wanted when we had that young woman be able to stand really proudly behind her piece and feel confident that she could then be an ambassador and represent her community in a really um, remarkable and emotional way. 
So with that, I wanted to just kind of transition to like the last section uh, of the work, which is really thinking about applying these participatory media techniques um, to a larger scale film. So currently right now, I'm working on a transmedia project which includes a feature film uh, about caste and untouchability in India. And you know, with 300 million people to kind of be able to represent, that's a pretty ambitious project. Um, but I think one of the things that you know, came out in a conversation we had earlier about participatory media is that this kind of work takes, is, it takes a lot of patience. Because you, if you come in with a particular agenda, um, you'll definitely get a story, but it may not be the story that's appropriate and at the point of need of the community that you're working with. So part of the thing that I've kind of adapted from the digital storytelling process to working on this feature film is just being able to sit and just listen and be with people wherever they're at, whether it's a Dalit millionaire who's the first millionaire in his community or a woman that's been evicted and is just sitting around with her belongings and you know, and dry sewage and covered in flies. Whatever that situation is, to sit and offer each person a moment of dignity and be there as a witness and be there to share that experience. And the funny thing with that is that, you know, I came in my first research trip with like a pretty extensive production package that was, you know, several thousands of dollars. But what was really interesting to me is that the most unexpected production tool wasn't my big camera package, it was actually my iPhone. And, and, I, and I bring that up not because I'm being sponsored by Apple, <laughs> but more that um, I think when you're working with communities that have been systematically marginalized for a very long time, the ability for them to initially take up space is actually very frightening. So I would find when I would bring out the camera and I'd put up tripods or I'd have like a handheld rig, um, people would shut down or they'd give very, uh, very uh, specific and non-emotional responses. Um, because that's how they're treated in society. You're able to have so many people exist on so many levels with each other because the people who are at the bottom are consistently not treated as human. They're not given eye contact. They move around everybody. So when they finally get that space, the amplification is too much. But as soon as the camera was put away, everyone just started joking and talking and figuring out stuff. Um, and so in that capacity, the iPhone was really great for that. You know, so I was able to take some really incredible moments and also get some audio at that moment, but also because most of the communities I was working with are also um, not, uh, aren't, aren't literate, the, 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 the ability on both the iPad or the iPhone or in tablets in general to have non-language non based interfaces and exchanges would let people who didn't speak or could write to be able to instantly say, oh, I can take a photo. Okay, I can crop it like this because I pinch and grab. The tactility took, like, took the place of being literate and gave them a feeling of parity and equity with me, which then allowed there to be a heart-to-heart -heart connection at that moment. So these were some of the photos that I took uh, with the iPhone. And um, you know, to me, what was really incredible about it was just how emotional you could get um, with just this little simple device. Uh, but more importantly, the other thing to think about is that when you're doing media making in a socially networked environment, the division between process and product really becomes a little bit more fluid because things that you're talking about in the process also become products. So what would happen is, is I would be with my phone in like a very rural environment, like this, like for example, with this photo. And then as soon as I'd take the photo, I would upload it to Instagram, and then from Instagram, put it to Facebook and Twitter. And then people who were following the project would then be able, would then be able to instantly communicate, either with the people there at that time, because I would try and stay there so there could be like an exchange if people were going to connect, or there would just be a tracking conversation that would be illuminating just for the perspectives that were being offered, which is really incredible. But it also shows what the limitations of our current social networks are. Because fundamentally, even though Facebook and Twitter and um, Vimeo and these other networks operate like civic spaces, they're not civic spaces. They're private entities run by corporations. And all of the data that you put up there is mined for marketing and also can be taken off at the behest of a state or anyone that finds your work controversial. And the policies around that are kind of not very well um, hidden. But more importantly, I think in the case of telling a community story, 
sometimes the knowledge that's being curated and being created collectively is larger than one person's page and larger than one person's feed. And a hashtag is not enough to be able to be able to harvest and be able to look at the content and material that's being developed. So that's kind of the final stage of this project, which is um, a website that's a participatory archive called Touchable. And um, it has a graphic interface where people can navigate stories. Um, and the interface is based on kind of traditional tribal art and can also be um, localized to both Indian as well as um, English languages. And one of the fundamental things that's really um, important about the site is that for untouchables, there's never been an archive of this. And for most untouchables, because untouchables are passing wherever they are, um, we're invisible in every city that we're a part of. So even though we participate in the history of that city, even though we're, we're sharing and making resources, um, our silence leads to an invisibility that's so palpable and so painful. And that silence is a doorway to violence. So in many ways, a portal like this and an archive like this that actually allows for collective knowledge curation, as well as the accessing of Dalit stories, is really to shift and um, break that. Uh, division. And within the members pages, you have choices of anonymity to full visibility, similarly that would parallel uh, what happens in real life that would allow people to engage with that. Um, the other thing is, is that it allows for the geographic tagging of stories and the geographic tagging of people. And this is really, really important because, once again, we're invisible in our cities. And this would be the first engine that would be able to kind of uh, show where we live, what we've participated in, and, and what our stories are. So um, I'm going to leave it at that because I think I'm over time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but I just want to leave you with this idea of the fact that we're curators of consciousness. And this is something that Holly and I talk about, that as participatory media makers, as digital storytellers, we're not going in with a hierarchical agenda. But rather, we, we are co-curating with our collaborators a place where we can shift consciousness, a place where we can shift stories, and a place where hope is not a target or a goal, but is actually a process. So with that, thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Jim Dubinsky. I'm a professor of rhetoric and writing in the Department of English and a member of the Community Voices team. I have a simple task to thank our guest, Thane Mori, for helping us understand the power and role of narrative in community building and exploring links among identity, narrative, and community change. We look forward to applying these lessons learned tonight about the power of story and song to our work and community life. Let's show our appreciation to Thane Mori. <laughs> Finally, I get to introduce uh, the next part of our program, uh, our, an interview and conversation with the audience. And I'll turn it over to John catherwood Good, a member of our Community Voices team. Thank you, Jim. And thank you so much, Thane Mori, for that artful presentation and your moving stories and, of course, your song. As Jim just said, my name is John Catherwood Ginn, and I'm a Master of Fine Arts student in Directing and Public Dialogue here at Virginia Tech. And I'm here just to sort of start off this conversation here. I prepared some questions just to sort of explore um, the role of narrative in your social change efforts. But more or less, my role is to prime the pump for a community conversation. And so after asking a couple questions, um, I'd love to turn things out to the crowd. If you have any questions for Thimori, Please raise your hand. Now, as you heard earlier, we're videotaping tonight's talk. And so that I'd ask, um, if you'd like to ask Thaymori a question, please raise your hand. I'll point to you. And then one of our wonderful ushers will come to you with a microphone. And we ask that you please speak in the microphone so we can capture your question on video. So without further ado, there's so many places where we can start within that very, very rich presentation in your body of work. Um, but considering what you just talked about, the, um, the film that you're working on in particular, The Touchable Project, I'd love to speak a little bit about that, if you'd be willing. So I was really moved by a particular phrase you used, that silence is the doorway to violence. And between that and the song you sang earlier um, and um, your work on touchability in general, there seems to be um, a particular acuity in exploring the challenge and the opportunity of speaking across difference. Quite often when that difference is racked with prejudice and hatred and things like that. Would you be willing to speak a little bit to some of the strategies you've employed 
with working with community members <clears throat> and speaking their story truthfully, but also for the listeners who, who maybe are um, dealing with those issues of prejudice mm -hmm. or hatred. Well, I, I try as much as possible to be facilitative as opposed to expository about people's experiences. And, you know, I was telling a story earlier this afternoon about one of the difficult places I had been shooting at was um, this area, this 5,000 people, 1,500 families had been evicted uh, to make room for a mall. And so I, would, I was witnessing the aftermath. It was two weeks afterwards, and you had people living in squalor, you know, dry sewage and just terrible shanty towns. And, you know, I'd never shot anything with so many tears in my eyes. You know, it was just awful, you know. But the thing was is that, you know, I had a really great mentor who told me that, you know, at that moment you could sell your camera. You know, at that moment you could just whatever money you have, give it and immediately deal with that situation. But it actually doesn't end the structural inequity that will create that situation again. So the thing that you can do, kind of like a surgeon on a battlefield, you know, where you're in triage, is to do what you're skilled the most and witness with the greatest amount of integrity that you can and, um, and as much as you can. So I think that, you know, a lot of what I try to do is um, be grounded, um, be really open with um, the people that I'm collaborating with. Um, and then also allow for them to frame me as much as I frame them. So oftentimes when I'm bringing cameras or equipment, um, I'll show the back to show what I'm framing. Um, I'll figure out ways for them to also be shooting some sort of materials. Uh, you know, so I'll always have uh, different production instruments at different levels so that someone could be shooting with an iPad or with an iPhone or you know, I'll have my traditional camera, but then I'll let them or I'll train them to be able to, to shoot on the go. Um, and this film has really been a remarkable gift in that way in that, you know, I may not have had crew, formal crew on my first research trip, but someone was always there to help with the camera or lift with the tripod because the urgency to tell the story was so there, you know. So mm -hmm. I think that answered your question. Oh, certainly. Yeah, yeah. And that question, <laughs> I'm so interested by the notion of, of staying grounded. There's somebody I, I work with, um, Carlton Turner of Alternate Roots. Yes. I know you met Carlton. Mm -hmm. He shared with me recently... Um, uh, he's very much involved himself as an artist in social change efforts, and he was talking about within the field, uh, you know, when you're an art maker, you reach a certain degree of success, and he said one of the biggest challenges of somebody creating art in, for social change is how do you stay grassrooted, particularly when, you know, awards and opportunities and publications are these forces that might lift you up to higher prominence or profile. Now, you've had, of course, a really rich career. As, as a young artist, you know, at the Sorbonne and being featured in The Source and things like that. H have you found that, that to be a challenge as, you, as your sort of profile rises for your very successful work to remain grassrooted? And if so, how do you navigate that balance? You know, I think that uh, I, I'm Buddhist, and so I, I just usually try and um, apply a, a process of non-attachment. So, you know, as an artist, you actually, you know, I'm one, one of my really great professors was talking about how, as a filmmaker, you're the richest poor person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, one night, you actually might be at, like, the most expensive restaurant in New York, and the next night, you're sleeping on the floor, like, in a hut or a village, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that I just always try to place myself in as many different geographies, both emotional and literal, uh, to keep uh, relevant and keep in flow, you know. So I think it's actually a personal choice as an artist about what that notion of grounding can mean. And I mean, I think there's grounding in terms of your achievement. There's also grounding in terms of your relevance and your relationships with community. So if you prioritize um, where those are, like in a, you know, on a spectrum for yourself, uh, I think it's 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 possible and doable, and I, I just I just have just always felt fluid like that. But it also might be comes from it may also come from the fact that I'm immigrant, you know. So I never had like a firm locality that I based my identity in. I was always having to bridge lots of different experiences and communities, and so I think I just kind of kept that through the disciplines that I work in and the social and cultural context that I travel. Mm -hmm. So with your work that you've done all over the world. Um, how do you feel like your work here in the New River Valley is similar and different to some of the other locales in India and South Africa? Well, what I love about the work in the valley, which was actually so helpful and really connected to my work in India, was that rural communities, while very be, being very distinctive and very specific, have a lot of the similar core um, heartbeat, 
You know, there's that sense of focus on local relationships and the way that story does inevitably connect everybody, and um, and some of the fears that um, young rural people have in terms of being able to engage with urbanness. Um, we saw that a lot in terms of the New River Valley, the Healthy New River Valley Initiative, that we were working with young people that were just at that age where they were starting to kind of branch out and make choices around college and feeling like little bits of insecurity and having to track and be able to build their identities. And that was the same exact experience that I faced with young rural people who were Dalit in India. The same intimidation, but also this remarkable clarity and power of spirit, you know? So I think being able to know where to validate and affirm what people's strengths are in those contexts, and also show the distance that's in perception is not really a distance that's not crossable, um, was very powerful, and I think it was great. Beautiful. Well, at this, at this point, I'd love to turn things out to the audience. If there's anybody out here who has a question they'd like to share with Timori, please feel free to raise your hand, and one of our ushers can, uh, can bring the microphone to you. Yes, over here, ma'am. Thank you. Hi. Um, Timori, I'd like to know what your story is and how you came to um, America to do this kind of work and how you left uh, your community. Well, um, you know, I don't know that we have the full, <laughs> so I'll, give you, I'll give you the five minute version. Um, my, in India, there's an affirmative action program called Reservation for Untouchables that was put into place after um, independence. And so my parents were the first recipients of reservation and my dad became a doctor and my mom became a doctor and the first, they were the first people in their communities to be um, educated. And it was through my dad, who immigrated here and became a doctor, um, that I was able to be born here. Um, but there's a mistake in thinking that just because I was born here that I didn't actually experience caste. And one of the things that was very um, remarkable about my family's experience was that we had to pass. So even though we knew we were untouchable in our home, we couldn't talk about it with other Indians because there were so few of us there and they were like your social link to being able to survive that first kind of you know, five or six years when you establish yourself. We had to hide. And I watched my parents lie about their names, um, not be really you know, directive about where they were from, what their villages were, um, change their language so that it would be clear that they would be caste neutral. Um, and so wh when I talk a lot about caste, I talk about my family's experience about um, passing, and then also the experience I had with other Indians that were here who were very casual about talking about their caste without knowing um, about the violence uh, with that it kind of undergirds within that. So that, that, those were kind of two kind of instigating experiences for me to be able to, um, to, to want to talk and be engaged with this work. And then as a filmmaker and a singer, I just, my, my, my cast is a performing cast, so I think it was just always in me to want to be able to tell and explore and share the experience of the people that I've worked with and um, the people that I come from. Uh, but it was definitely a strange journey. <laughs> so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Other questions? So uh, one thing that you were mentioning, I think, over and over again, was just a general lack of confidence in the people that you talk to and a lot of personal reservation. What were some patterns that you saw that you brought in yourself or just the environment that you created that allowed them to have the confidence to speak and grow as individuals? Mm. Uh, that's a great question. So I think that, you know, first of all, whenever you're doing a participatory model, a participatory media training model, whether it's digital storytelling or a larger project, you need to really make sure that as a filmmaker, you have a social intelligence for watching um, when, when a person is shut down and when a person is open. Because what you want to do is create a training environment that's very flexible and nimble based on what you're seeing happening as someone opens and closes up. So I think, one, it starts with the facilitator first knowing that that's kind of the conditions you're working in. The other thing is, is that um, a lot of what we would do is um, I use a lot of humor and I also um, put film and technology within a spectrum of other kind of cultural and performance arts. So whenever you're doing like a training or work with me, there's always kind of like singing. There's like, you know, there might be graffiti work. There might be like, you know, Gungam style. <laughs> Who knows? But the thing is to disarm the 
the, disarm the fear of being put on Front Street and let it be a culture of play to be able to share and explore and go deep. Um, and then I also think what's another really key important thing is to set ground rules and so that people feel like they can share in a safe space without judgment. So if you kind of establish ground rules from the beginning, set up a culture of play and exploration, and then have a social intelligence to kind of move and watch the group kind of develop, you can get people to feel, really make a lot of progress in three days to feeling confident in that. Um, and then I also think the, the final thing is being vulnerable yourself. You know, When you're vulnerable yourself and you share deeply, people are inspired to know, well, okay, if the teacher's doing that or if the facilitator's doing that, well, I can give a little bit, you know. You know? So it's, it's an exchange and it's a learning process. And, uh, and I think the only way to do it is to have the experience of doing it. And, you know, the, the benefit, I'm actually here for residency for um, the next, like, six weeks, and we're actually doing two digital storytelling workshops through the Narrative Praxis Initiative. So if it's something that you would like to learn more about or be a part of, either as like learning from a training perspective or to do a story, you should definitely come up to me and Holly afterwards because we can talk more about it and find out what your interests are and then support you through that. It's in the insert. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we have time for one more question if somebody would like to ask the Amori. I'd be interested to know what you thought of County 2012. Oh, that's a long question. Um, well, I think that the, you know, I think that uh, the beyond the content of Coney 2012, which uh, for me was actually problematic in the way that it framed the agency of the people involved. Um, uh, I think that what's really interesting to study is the efficacy of that model, and a lot of what made Coney 2012 successful wasn't actually social networking. It was all the actual real bricks and mortar networking they had done before its launch. Because he was extremely well connected within certain faith-based communities and they'd been already kind of making the rounds. So when that film was distributed, it could take advantage like that and then kind of spread like wildfire. And, and I think that's an important lesson to keep in mind. Twitter doesn't make a revolution. Twitter's just a tool. You know, so if you want to be able to kind of spark something of similar um, power, I think it's really about thinking about have you done that kind of work first, you know. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that because we don't have uh, a lot more time to talk about the actual messaging and content, but I will say that it's not necessarily an angle I would have taken, you know. Hey, Maury, thank you so much for your generosity, your time, the care you put into this presentation and the wisdom you shared with us tonight. If you're interested in Thay Mori's work, I encourage you to check out the links that are within the insert um, that Holly mentioned earlier. And if you'd like to see more Community Voices um, talks, I'd encourage you to uh, leave your contact information. We have a little box out front um, with Community Voices info sheets. But otherwise, let's, I'd say let's have one more round of applause for our guest speaker. Thank you so much.